I'm actually recording this on Easter, um, just because that works better with my schedule. Um, this is my uh, traditional Easter shirt that I wear. It's a phoenix, <laughs> because I'm a dork. Um, I hope whoever watched the uh, Mirko video that I did that went up on Easter, I hope everybody liked that one. Um, and this one I am going to be doing one piece again, which is generally what I talk about with some of my hero thrown in there. But <clears throat> um, in regards to my, I was wrong, in regards to One Piece, um, I'm going to talk about Thriller Bark. The arc itself, partially the island, I guess, um, slash ship, slash island, slash, I don't know, random piece of what raw earth that's floating in the middle of the Florian Triangle right now since I don't know if the Thriller Bark Island we saw at um, Hachinosu is actually the same one or not. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so this is going to be me talking a little bit about some things that I kind of noticed a bit in Thriller Bark itself in the course of the uh, arc and comparing it to other things that happen in the uh, series itself. Um, so, some things that I kind of noticed in Thriller Bark when I was going through some of it again is similarities to other things that happen in One Piece. Now, obviously, One Piece is a story that's been going on for, you know, 25 years. You know, I think almost 25 years or a little over that at this point in time. So, similarities cropping up is not that surprising by any means. Um, in that regard <laughs> for like oh this popped up here this same thing happened here this person had the same remark about this character so that's not surprising but i did want to go over a few things that i noticed that were similar in um uh thriller bark to other things in one piece now i know the arc in one piece that a lot of people claim is like this metaphor for the series as a whole is you know sky pia and I'm not going to argue with that. I mean, I can see a lot of the things that are uh, comparable in Skypea to, you know, things that get referenced and other things with, you know, Luffy being, you know, uh, you know, Eneru's natural enemy and everything like that with him being rubber and Eneru being lightning and all of that other stuff and, you know, showing up and freeing the Skypeans and the Shandians and getting them to, you know, live peacefully together and everything. That I have no problem with. Um, what I wanted to do in regards to Thriller Bark is point out similarities that happen there to other things that happen in One Piece. Um, so kind of the, the title is bringing the sun to Thriller Bark and the fact that Luffy is, you know, the sun god Mika, that he is the reincarnation of that with the devil fruit, with the devil fruit, not saying that he's, you know, Nika and, you know, reincarnate or whatever, but he is the bearer of Nika's will at the moment, given the fact that the devil fruit has basically, you know, declared that. Um, and literally what happens in the arc is the Straw Hats show up on Thriller Bark and through everything that happens during the arc, Thriller Bark itself gets brought into the sunlight out of this endless darkness of the Florian Triangle and of Moria's rule and brought into the light, into the sun. And so I wanted to point out some similarities that happen with that in representations of other things that happen in the series. Um, so first off, I already mentioned Moria. So we have Moria stealing people's shadows pretty much indiscriminately because we've seen that he takes shadows from Marines and pirates and civilians. We see that because um, at the end of the arc when everybody's, you know, shadows are going back to them, we see other shadows, you know, we get a marine, see, get his shadow back, we see civilians and other pirates, and of course everybody that's, you know, part of the Thriller thriller Bark's Victim Association group with Lola and her crew and such, they all get their shadows back, as do the other Straw Hats that got their shadows back, um, and such at the end of the arc. After, you know, after Luffy is able to gut punch Moria and his shadows Asgard form and release all of them. Um, so... We get that, which, you know, Moria, I kind of took this as this representation of a similarity to how the world nobles take slaves as they wish or use the Marines to their whims. And the fact that, you know, you know, literally the next arc in One Piece is, you know, Sabaody and we meet 
Charlos and his horrible family and just the way that they act, Moria acted very entitled in that regard. Part of that comes from the fact that he's, you know, within his domain and he's kind of master of his own domain and he can just, you know, take anybody's shadow that he wants. He's not used to people being able to put up the type of fight that Luffy did. Um, and with the World Nobles, they very much have the, for the most part, from the ones we've seen, from the ones we've seen, they do have the entitlement thing of literally raised their entire lives in the belief that they are the ones that should be, you know, that they are the gods of this world. And they, you know, we see Charles just take a, a you know, a girl because he thinks she's pretty and decides to take her and make her his wife, even though she's got, has a fiance and he shoots the fiance. He shoots someone else because they're in his way. He tries to take Kami because she's a mermaid and he wants to feed her to piranhas and he's an idiot and all of that other stuff. And all the other times that we see how the celestial dragons act in those regards, for the most part, you know, we have Millsgard, who is definitely a good one at this point in time. Stuff that happens with Homini and his wife, uh, yeah, notwithstanding. And then we have the Gorosei. And the Gorosei, they don't, you know, given the fact that they allow those things to happen means that they're not against it. Because they're not going around and being like, hey, we probably shouldn't have slaves anymore. They're like, no, they don't care. They're just like, eh, keep some people under thumb. Um, another one is... Uh, the people on Thriller Bark who have their shadows stolen are like um, how the people are treated by the world nobles and the marines. As in the fact that the people on the island, you know, if they're, you know, if they're pirates, I can understand that the marines aren't going to make up a big woof about the fact that Moria is using their shadows. But if they're civilians or other marines, and yeah, Moria is a warlord, but still... He still ends up, you know, taking marine shadows and other civilians and stuff like that and, like, putting them into his own zombies. And the marines do nothing about this. You cannot tell me that, you know, some of the other marines that have had to deal with Moria in the past, whether it be Suru or Garp or Sengoku or whoever, that have had to deal with Moria in the past do not know that he has taken marine shadows. And in the fact that it being civilians that get ignored that are on the island is the fact that the marines for the most part tend to ignore countries and kingdoms that are not associated with the world's government because they can't pay the holy tribute uh the heavenly tribute whatever it's called that they're ignored because of that they i know it's a i know it's a filler arc but that's very very well demonstrated in the uh, Little East Blue arc that they have that ties into Strong World. That is very well represented represented there. Um, and the way that they are, that the people of that island are ignored by the world's government and by the Marines and such because they can't pay the heavenly tribute. So I like that. I know it's filler, but it's a very applicable thing in this regard because that is the way that it probably is for a lot of islands. Because we have no idea if um, Syrup Village or Kokiachi Village or that type of stuff are associated with the world government. Given the fact that Kokiachi Village did have a marine base near it with, you know, <sighs> Nezumi and everything, there is an implication that they were, but we don't really know. It's never 100% explained. Um, down the line, I kind of saw, this is, this might be stretching a little bit, Luffy involved here, um, I wanted to point out the general zombies, the zombie generals that Moria has that are supposed to be these huge, powerful zombies that get squished by Orz's butt. Um, and don't put up any form of a fight at all, really. Um, they get awakened by Absalom to be a, you know, witnesses at his wedding, and then the wedding doesn't happen because he gets defeated by Sanji and then electrocuted by Nami, and then they get squished by oars. Um, so I kind of saw this as like putting an end to the old guard of the Marines and the pirates. Not that all of the old guard of the Marines are bad because Garp is not bad. Um, Aokiji, even though he's not part of the Marines anymore, give or take what you want to say about sword and however that works, 
there's that. But Sengoku, I would not say Sengoku is bad. Same thing with Suru. Same thing with some of them who are like the old guard. And then you have the new guard coming in that are Kobe and Helmeppo and probably a lot of the other members of S.W.O.R.D. along with Smoker and Toshigi and Hina and some of the other ones that we've seen are this new guard coming in. The same thing is applicable when it comes to the pirates, getting rid of the old guard of Kaido and Big Mom that are these horrible pirates. And Shanks says a little bit of like the in-between generation in that regard between the, you know, the old Yonko, because he was, you know, the youngest Yonko, still, well, at the end of the day, he still technically is, but that's only out of the original Yonko because Luffy is obviously younger than Shanks. Um, but, you know, in that regard, you have, you know, Big Mom and Kaido, and you had Whitebeard, who was a good pirate, and, you know, that type of stuff, but, and by the way, if I had to choose between living under Kaido's rule and Big Mom's rule, I would pick Big Mom's rule, and I would just aim to try to be at an island that she would really have no business being on, if I could. <laughs> It's like, she has no business to be on this island. Okay, I feel slightly safer. I'll still pay the freaking tribute. Um, the tithing, the, you know, leave her life thing. I'll still pick that. Um, <laughs> I'll still pick that. Um, so, um, over having to live in Kaido's, um, under Kaido's rule for the most part. Um, but still prefer Shanks under any of them at the moment, but still. Um, but... We see that in the fact that, you know, Kaido and Big Mom have been defeated. They are ousted. And we saw, you know, Whitebeard fall away in that regard. But, you know, he was like, you know, one of the good ones. Same thing with Shanks. If Shanks ends up having to fight Luffy and gets defeated down the line, or however the case goes with that, however that goes, there's that regard too. But there's also, you know, this new guard coming in where, where it's, you know, Luffy and his crew and Law and his crew. And, you know, some of the other good pirates that we've seen, letting the world know that not all pirates are bad, coming in and showing them that. That kind of ties into something else I'll mention too, but like this changing of the old guard and the fact that, you know, these zombie generals, you know, they literally had Captain John as one of the members of it. And he, you know, he was part of Rox's crew, which is very much part of the same guard that, you know, Whitebeard and Kaido and Big Mom came from and all of that so there's that representation there um next up we have lola and the rolling pirates i love lola she's great um <laughs> uh same thing with chiffon i love her as well um but with lola and the rolling pirates they represent these you know the good pirates that are in the world that are just being beaten down because of the fact that you know they have bounties Lola does not strike me as the pirate that's going to go around raiding villages and stuff like that that have done nothing against her and her crew because, you know, she's she's been told no in regards to proposals over 4,000 times at that point in time. She's not phased by it at all. She's not going to she's not going to pull a kid and like destroy a town just because some guy refused to marry her when she proposed. She's not going to do that. But, you know, she also represents this, you know, kind of this thing of like, pulling together you know, the, the Thriller Bark Victims Association, gathering them together and like them working together to capture all of the shadows and everything. And, you know, they join up with Luffy to fight. And I kind of see this, you know, or at least, you know, <laughs> you know, they kind of, um, I also see this as like, you know, they joined up with Luffy to fight and I would still love it if like Beiji shows back up with like, and has Lola and all of them with him. And like, they're just like, hey, Lola. And like, Nami's happy because she gets to see Lola again. I still want that to happen. I want that to happen. That is a reunion I want to see happen, but I don't know if it ever will. It depends on what, ha it depends on how things go. But, um, you know, it kind of shows this representation of pirates who are seen as bad by the general public, but in actuality, they're not bad. The same way that like Brooke and his crew were not bad. The same way that, you know, um, Pedro and Peck, uh, Pedro and Zeppo and such that they were deemed as pirates because they were trying to learn about history when they weren't that that wasn't their intention at all. They you know they weren't trying to be pirates, so there's they got deemed as pirates and other things like that. Or there's other people out there that have definitely just been you know branded as pirates simply because the world government they're going against the world government. Now, admittedly, Lola did come from a pirate family in the fact of who her, you know, mother is and everything, literally. So there's that. But 
Um, also, it I kind of see it as like this: um, the pirates, the bad, the good pirates that are you know freed because they're no longer seen as villains by the entire world. They're kind of given a chance, uh, a little bit more. Admittedly, you still want to be wary of pirates just in general, but you know, give them a chance. Um, I, you know, I do kind of see the, um, the way that Moria uses the zombies and similar to how the world nobles, specifically the Gorosei and Imu-sama, use the marines and cipher pole and an extent pirates in regards to the Shishibukai when that was still going as a way to eliminate threats to their control over the world, to their hold over the world. Moria uses his zombies so he doesn't have to go and fight. Because it's like, oh, if my zombies can take them down or can capture them and then I can just use their shadows to my own abilities, then we're good. Same thing with the way the warlords were. Uh, the way that the world nobles, excuse me, were is like, oh, well, the Gorosei specifically are like, well, mm, let's make some of these pirates on our side. So that way we can, you know, kind of keep an eye on them and use them to our own means at times, specifically with the way that they used um, Doflamingo to communicate with Kaido to get weapons and stuff like that that they used for that, you know, chain of communication and everything. And with Moria, it's of course, he just, you know, he just uses whatever happens to fall into his lap in regards to like, oh, oh, this one has a strong shadow. Oh, this, this pirate has like a whatever million berry bounty Luffy had at that point in time. And he's just like, oh, yeah, I'll put this shadow inside of oars and we'll see what happens there. So there's that whole thing that happens. Um, and uh, one of my favorite moments in it that this actually does lead into a point is when Shindri is freed by Chopper from Moria's control. Um, literally kind of cutting the strings that Moria uses in order to control Shindri by kind of making her her body gains some form of self-awareness and you know freeing her to a degree yeah she's not fully freed until after her shadow has been you know fully released not just from her body but also released and returned to the woman who it originally came from but we see that represented you know kind of showing the fact that um you know shindri is this citizen this civilian who she had nothing to do with pirates before moria or before um hogback you know stole her corpse which is disgusting um and then resurrected at the back and i'm talking about this on easter is funny um <laughs> i don't i don't dismiss the uh, irony in that um and you know resurrected her and everything in that regard with you know the, the woman shadow and such and then proceeded to just you know, yes, he humored her to a degree, but he could also just literally beat her and do anything else against her and abuse her, and she couldn't really do anything. We see that more near the end, because it is more used as, like, a humorous way at the fact of, like, oh, I don't like plates, so here's your soup on a on the table, or here's your pasta, and, you know, just drops it on the table in front of him. You know, that type of stuff, or just how, like, how, how many good burns she gets in on, on Hogback is just hilarious, and I love that. But then, you know, he just abuses her later on when Chopper and Robin show up to try to fight her and free her. And, you know, Chopper is able to help connect with her and, you know, get her to somewhat resist, you know, the commands that Hogback is giving her. And I kind of see this as a representation of how, like, you know, cutting the strings that the Gorosei have um, as their, you know, machinations that they use to control the world with, like, hmm, we may need to do another cleansing soon, or hmm, let's make that island disappear. They, uh, they fell too far down for us to control, or hmm, let's send the cipher pole in after these people and get rid of a couple of them. You know, that same type of a thing, and the fact that, you know, by a technicality, we kind of see this during the reverie and the fact that like, you know, uh, you know, the 50 kings that are gathered together, the 50 rulers, because we see several queens and such there as well, but the 50 rulers that are gathered together there, we see that they do vote to, you know, that they wish to allow for, you know, the, the merfolk, you know, the Fishman Island people to be able to come to the surface and everything and actually live on the surface and such. And, you know, they agree with that the Gorosei allow it to happen 
and Emu Sama doesn't seem to be going against it at the time. So there's like that whole thing that it's just like, well, it kind of aligns in with what we want. So we're okay with it. And with all the machinations they did to try, you know, that they got rid of Ohara and everything like that. And the fact that they're literally going after their best scientists right now, in that regard, you know, manipulating the Marines into doing that. Um, and uh, I do kind of, uh, the next one I have here, it, it's a bit of a stretch, yes. Um, the Straw Hats versus Ors, I kind of put this as a little bit of like, possibly foreshadowing a little bit of like them having to fight against Blackbeard who is, is, is like the seemingly unbeatable object and the fact that Ors up to that point was literally the, the, the largest enemy they ever fought and just with how strong he was and with being manipulated by Moria Shadow Powers making it even more you know making him even harder of an opponent and then adding in Moria after that with all of that also, Moria manipulates shadows. Blackbeard has the yami yami on me and can manipulate darkness. So there's that. Um, there's that whole regard in there. So I'm like, eh, well, I can I can see a comparison there. Also, I mean, yes, Garp might be able to do a fair amount of damage to you know the the captains, the Titanic captains that are on Hachinosu at the moment. But again. We'll see what happens if Blackbeard ends up showing up. And then there's the whole thing that's going on with Blackbeard and Law at the moment. I don't want Law to die, but we'll see what happens. Um, in those regards, um, so this, you know, the seemingly unbeatable object in the form of Ors or Blackbeard, and the fact that it's just like, well, you know, how much damage can he take? And how much stronger has he gotten with having both Devil Fruits and having had time to learn how to control them? Also, if it does end up being that he kills Law and he gains the power of the Op Op Devil Fruit, then that just makes him even more OP of an opponent for, you know, Luffy and the others to have to deal with. Even if they do have allies show up, even if they do have the ability to team up against several of them in that regard, even if Aokiji does turn on them, even if they end up fighting amongst themselves, you know, all of that. Um, at the very least with, you know, Moria, he at least cared about Absalom and Hogback and Perona. We see that. We see that he did care about them and that he cared very much about his previous crew and that's why he went into using zombies. And slight tangent here. I think that back when the world government was formed, yes, they may have been up against, you know, the Great Kingdom and things like that in that regard with Joy Boy and the fact that we hope that Joy Boy was a good person and that the Great Kingdom was a good place, give or take what's going on and other instances we've seen. The world government, those 20 kings and then the 19 that stayed and then, you know, the Nefeltari family, there is the concept of they probably did want to initially protect their world, protect what they had built with their kingdoms, and then bring other kingdoms in under their protection. We don't know when they started fully calling themselves the Celestial Dragons, when they started having the Tenryu Bito and the Gorosei and having all of this other stuff where they started fully believing that they were general that they were gods we don't know when that came into account we don't know if that was within the first two generations or if that was even further on down the line where that fully came into effect it's been seven eight hundred years in that regard since that happened and if they did you know if it took a while for that to start up then you know there may have been other smaller revolutions and things like that. And they had to, you know, do other things at that point in time, wipe out other history. And, you know, just decided, just like, we shouldn't really gain, we shouldn't really have attachment to anything that happens in the lower realm. So they just like cut off any of that type of an attachment that they had. The same way that Moria, yes, he cares about Absalon and Perona and Hogback. He cared about them, but the rest of his zombies, for the most part, if, you know, if they got knocked out or defeated and stuff like that, you know, they were weak. And he, you know, he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to worry about losing his crewmates again because that already happened against Kaido. And, you know, we don't know how much of a loss 
you know, how many losses that they had on the side of, you know, the 20 kings in that regard either. So there's that question. Um, for that, that impetus of like wanting to just not care about the lower realm had to come from somewhere, whether that's something from Eam, whether that's something from like previous generations of the Gorose, we don't know yet. Hopefully that will get explained, but that was just something that I just kind of thought of. Um, uh, another representation for Lola and the Thriller Bark Victims Association is how they worked under Moria's nose for several years in order to collect all of these different shadows and everything that they then ended up giving to Luffy to turn him into Nightmare Luffy. Car. And I kind of see that as a representation of the way that Dragon and Sabo and the Revolutionary Army have been kind of, you know, under the world government's nose and building up their army and trying to find other kingdoms and other, you know, allies that they can use, you know, Dragon is an ally with Vegapunk. <laughs> There's that right there. Literally, he has had the world government's best scientist as his friend, as his colleague, as his ally for the last 20 whatever years that Vegapunk has been working for the world government. So... Yeah, there's that. There's that whole thing there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they were the ones that gave, you know, Lola and the others were the ones that gave Luffy the shadows that allowed him to turn into Nightmare Luffy. So there's this, you know, there's that similarity there. Also, in regards to Lola, the fact that part of one of the things that just makes me love her so much is when she bravely stands up to Moria... Uh, even, uh, you know, being burned by the sun at that point in time with, you know, the fact that, you know, Orr is jumping up and, you know, moving the island ended up getting it to, you know, head into the sun. And the sunlight is streaming through at that point in time. And all of them are, you know, so many of them are, you know, Robin doesn't have her shadow. Sanji and Brooke don't have their, you know, well, Brooke has his shadow back, but like Sanji and Zoro and Luffy don't, don't have their shadows back. A bunch of the other ones still don't have their shadows back because Moria is still in his shadows Asgard form. And still has them all. And like they're burning. And like her crew even try to pull her out of there. So she you know, isn't on fire anymore. And she just goes back. And like she rallies them. And I kind of see this as. The you know the people in the world. And the nations of the world. Finally rising up against the oppression. That they've been under for the last 800 years. From the world government. And finally just being like no. We're sick of all of you treating us like this. We're sick of you taking our children and our people and turning them into your slaves or your wives simply to just throw them away or kill them when you're done with them because you lost interest in them or they step, they kept, they lost entertainment for you. They're no longer an entertainment source for you and you just get rid of them or, you know, for the ones that escaped and everything like that in regards to, you know, the ones that were freed by Fisher Tiger and other instances where they were able to escape and such. We're sick and tired of you doing that. And, you know, we're sick and tired of you taking our money or allowing our horrible monarchs, like the ones that were at Lelusia Kingdom or in regards to Wapo on Drum Island and stuff like that, letting these horrible monarchs stay in charge just because they pay you. Or having Marines that get bribed and were sick and tired of that. <sighs> like what happened with Nezu on Kokiyashi Village and everything with him being bribed by Arlong. And other Marines that get bribed by pirates to allow them to keep doing what they're doing as long as they don't report back to the you know Marine headquarters and everything. Admittedly, Nezu was the worst case of this. Um, but we also saw some of that with like the rat marine that was at Sphinx Island and other things like that. The fact that, you know, again, this, the, you know, Sphinx Island is again, the representation of like the countries that are not protected by the world government and the Marines because they can't pay the heavenly tribute and like that showing that there and that type of thing, this, you know, representation of like all these other ones, like joining up, joining with the revolutionary army or joining with the pirates and stuff like that, like Alabaster, right? Alabaster rising up and Dressrosa and other things like that, rising up and dealing, you know, fighting against the world government that way. And, um, I got two left and I'm done. Um, another one is, you know, this, I've seen some people comparing like Nightmare Luffy as like this precursor 
to Gear 5th Luffy. Um, which I can see. I can definitely see some of that comparison there uh, in that regard. Uh, Nightmare Luffy is kind of fun. Uh, he doesn't last very long, um, but that's also, you know, exactly with Gear 5th. It's like Gear 5th. Luffy can have a lot of fun when he's in Gear 5th. He's like, that's when I'm at my freest and everything. But it still doesn't last an exceedingly long amount of time. He can only use that power for, you know, a certain extent before he gets really, really tired again. And then he has to, like, recharge his batteries again. Kind of similar to what happens with a lot of his other forms when he first uses, you know, Gear 3rd and Gear 4th and everything like that. Where he's just, like, really, really weak afterwards for a while and can't really summon up his hockey. And, you know... We see some of that. Um, so that's just like that being like a precursor to that a little bit. Um, and that it is kind of this, he's referred to as Nightmare Luffy, but he is this, you know, via what he's able to do in regards to fighting Oars and then fighting Moria with the help of everybody else, also all the crew helping, of course, um, in regards to taking down Oars and Moria. That, you know, this nightmare that Luffy became then ends up being the one that frees the people on the island and restores their shadows and Luffy's own shadow and the shadows of his crew members that were taken and the shadows of people around the world that, you know, civilians, marines, other pirates and stuff like that that Moria has taken shadows from. And, you know, so we see that and, you know... You know, all of all of that that's, you know, that we get to, you know, witness during that with Thriller Bark and everything. And then the last one is Bink Sake. Now, Luffy has mentioned before that, of course, he knows Bink Sake because it's what Shanks and his crew used to sing at the bar all the time. And probably because Shanks grew up hearing those, you know, pirate songs and stuff like that from Roger and Rayleigh and stuff like that when he was on their crew, when he, you know, when he was raised by them. And, like, they probably heard it from other people. And it went through. Or maybe they learned it from Crocus, and Crocus learned it from Brooke when him and the Rumbar Pirates came through. It's also one of those types of thoughts there, too. But, of course, we have Brooke singing Bing Sake and wanting to reunite with... Let the motorcycle go past. Why? And just, you know, having all of that... You know, having, you know, Brooke wanting to be reunited with Laboon, which is a representation of, like, you know, the red line having to come down. So that way that can not just be Brooke and Laboon reunited, but also Brooke or, like, Laboon and the rest of the, you know, island whales being reunited in that regard. Or being able to travel where they're supposed to be able to travel to. So I did, I wanted to, I wanted to point that out too. Um, also, it's just a nice song in general. And also a lot of people look at Bank Sake as a representation itself of like the one piece itself that it's been passed down as like a verbal history of, you know, passing down the tale of Joy Boy and stuff. So that's, that's there too. Um, with this lost history still, even though not everybody knows what it means, still getting passed down. Um, you know, so kind of, kind of like how, like, they still make references to, like, the sun god. Because, like, the sun god is mentioned in Skypea way back then. And then there's still other things that, you know, represent it at various other places throughout the course of One Piece. So, you know, those little, those little plants that, like, now we look back and like, oh my god, Oda's a genius. And it's just like, I, I forgot I did that, so I just threw it in here and used it. <laughs> Is kind of the way a lot of that goes. Um, but I just, I wanted to point that out um, just because that was, that was some, some things that I noticed that just kind of seemed not coincidental, but at least like it, there are representations here. There are similarities enough here that I, I, I wanted to mention it. So that's what I have. I thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you have a nice rest of your day. If you think of something else that I missed, um, please comment. So I thank you for watching and have a nice day. Bye.